Let's stand and give praise to the Lord this morning. Psalm 103 says, let's bless the Lord, all our souls, and let's not forget all his benefits. Everything he does for us is healing. He's removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. Amen. He has given us hope today. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Oh, my praise belongs to you forever. Let's sing it now. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come together. Come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is, this is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by jesus christ the righteous i'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony this is my testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story i'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Yes, Lord. We think about all your goodness, Lord. If I'm not dead, if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Think about that phrase. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. This is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is not a lie. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Yeah. Let's sing again. If I'm not dead, you're not done, Lord. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. 
Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. The greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. Yeah, we sing together. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Yeah. My testimony, Lord. You brought us, Lord, from death to life. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, welcome. So wonderful to be back together celebrating God and worshiping Him together. We're so glad that you're back with us. And if you're with us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we are in this wonderful series on the gifts of the Spirit of God that He has for us. And it's just my prayer that God moves powerfully today in our midst and through His Word. So would you just pray with me as we get into today? Jesus, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for Your Scriptures. Thank You for the truths You're about to teach us today. And I just pray we draw close to You in Your heart. May, uh, may Your Word speak in a way that just opens our eyes to the incredible gifts You have for us today, God. And we just thank You for what You're going to do in advance in Jesus name amen well we've been in this wonderful series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, today we're only going to focus in on one of them and uh, we're going to spend all of our time looking at really the gift of the discerning of spirits and so we're going to find out what that is in first Corinthians 12:10, we're going through that list and when we come up to this it says to another discern discerning of spirits like I said we're going to spend all of our time really talking about what it means to have this gift of discerning of spirits and why it's needed because in a way uh, I kind of think that this gift is overlooked. It's kind of one that's kind of hidden and often overlooked and not a whole lot of details or emphasis is put on it. And yet, if I'm honest, I think it's one of the most important gifts that we have and that we need in the church today. And, and we're going to find out why uh, because uh, we're just going to uncover that. But let me just set it up by just saying this. One of the reasons why we need discernment is because there are deceptions all around us today. I think uh, we can easily see see this we can we can see it in just if you take advertising for example you can kind of just see how deceptions play in that I don't know about you but I mean have you ever seen these pills that say hey you buy these pills take them and while you sleep the fat will just fall off of you and you buy them you take the pills and you wake up fatter than you were before you start taking the pills uh, and there's just a deception that they never told you you had to exercise as well as take the pills or maybe I did this. Uh, there was an advertisement for this polish that you buy and, and you put it on your wooden tables and it takes all the scratches out. And they had this great demonstration. I bought it and it just made my scratches look shinier. It didn't take them away at all. Or maybe it was something different like, the, you know, a stain remover. And you see like, oh, look at the stain remover. It takes all of these stains. It even takes wine out. And I, I buy it. I put it on my daughter's wife white shirt that's spilled with spaghetti sauce and guess what it still has a red spot there it just doesn't work and I'm sure that really if you were to take the time and read the fine print you would find out there's a reason why it didn't work the way they said it was going to work but the point is is that we don't have time to read the fine print and the, they use deception to sell us otherwise they would have been up front in those things and so most of you probably know that we have also more information 
uh, out there than we've ever had at any other time, right at our fingertips in history, right? We have all of this information, and yet we have no idea if what we're re- reading we can believe if it's true or not. I mean, we joke and we say, you know, if it's on the internet, it must be true, <laughs> but deep down inside, we know that what we read on the internet needs to be checked and rechecked and overchecked again and again and again because you just can't trust it. Most of it, a lot of it is not true. Uh, Most people I know don't even trust what they see on the news because we really have come to the realization of understanding that people can twist and take angles of things and make it say whatever they want to say so you can't even trust your eyes that what you're seeing is rooted in your truth because so much of our news is rooted in opinions, right? And so this is just kind of the culture that we live in and it sets us up because one of the things about deception that's so tricky is You don't even know you're deceived while you're being deceived. That's why it's a deception. In the middle of it, you don't even know because it's just that deceptive. And this is why it's critical that we understand true deception doesn't appear false or dangerous, okay? Just we don't recognize it as that. If it did, we wouldn't buy into it, right? If if you saw it as false, if you saw it as dangerous, you'd be like, eh, not going to purchase that or not going to buy into that lie, right? Instead, deception misleads subtly in such a way where all of a sudden it looks attractive and appealing, but later on we find out like it wasn't fully the truth of what we bought into. This isn't what I signed up for. That's what deception does. And so what does this have to do with our spiritual lives? That God would take and give us a a gift a spiritual gift specifically designed for this in his church. We'll take a look at this verse, 1 Timothy 4, 1. And it says this, The Spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Listen, if deception is not revealed, the end result is that it will shipwreck the faith of many people. And it really has been what has shipwrecked many people's faith. It's, they were deceived. They thought they were believing a truth, but they literally believed a lie and it, it took them away from God. Okay? And, and so God gives us a gift so that we can recognize that this is going on. Look what it says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, uh, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now listen, we have been going through the gifts of the Spirit. What is on that list? So many of the things, right? You prophesy in my name, you perform miracles, you cast out demons, all in the name of the Lord, and yet somehow you get to the end and, and, and you're facing God and he says, away from me, I never knew you. And I don't know about you, but that is an incredibly sobering verse for anybody who calls themselves a believer, that we could somehow go through this life doing great things for God in his name and at the end of life really get to a spot where we actually never knew who God was and that he says, away from me. Listen, God has given us this gift to help deal with deceptions that pop up in our lives and in the church so that we are not deceived. Discernment is what the Holy Spirit does to show us if something really is the Holy Spirit. It really is God. It really is to expose then what is, ends up being all about me as a person or all about the demonic as well. It exposes those areas too. And so discernment answers the question, how can you tell if it is the Spirit of God or not? That's what we need it for. Because we need to know if it's God or if it's not God. And so let's get into this and let's talk about some areas where we need this discernment uh, of God to come into our lives. The very first is, you know, th- it's the gift of discernment is to discern if gifts being used are from God or not. I mean, this is really the context. God's laying out this list, or Paul's laying out this list, 1 Corinthians 12, of the Spirit. And really, we come to the gifts of, of discernment, being able to discern if things are of the Spirit of God or not, in the context of gifts. 
And, and so this is really important because it's given to the body to know if the gifts are being used to bring God glory, if they really are from the Spirit of God or not. I know that may sound a little strange at first, but just because something happens in church doesn't mean it was God. You realize that, right? I mean, this is what I think actually turns people away from God sometimes is that something happened in church that was ungodly. <laughs> and let me just say, just because it happened in church, again, it doesn't mean it was of God. And God has given us the Holy Spirit and his gifts to discern when those things really happen. So we kind of don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't walk away from church church, we realize that wasn't God and we move on, okay? This is what the Holy Spirit is meant to do. And so he shows up sometimes, again, look at that, that, that um, definition again with me. The Holy Spirit shows us uh, if something is really him or if it's our person's natural abilities or if something is even really demonic in nature. Listen, quite frankly, sometimes what is done in the name of the Holy Spirit is simply a person wanting attention. I mean, that's unfortunate, but it is true. And when that happens, God wants to expose it because God wants to be the head of his church. He doesn't want somebody else being the focus of his church. And so he's going to expose it when it's done in wrong motives. When I think about my wife, let me just illustrate it with this. When I think of my wife, you know, my focus I actually have a picture of her on my phone. I don't, listen, my focus is on her face. I don't have a picture of her hands or her arms or something like that. And in my head, when I think of my wife, Carrie, I don't think of a body part. I think of her face. Why? Because that is who she is. That's her essence. And, and listen, when, when we're to think about the church, we shouldn't be thinking about some other part of the church. We should be thinking about God. He's our focus. And anything that we're to take away from him being the main focus as being the head of the church is, is really something that needs to be exposed. It's really something that's operating not with the right motives. And so when a gift is being used to prop up a person, then God's going to expose that with discernment. And so we're going to get that sense that really that wasn't God because it wasn't. God is always going to bring something to point to himself, not to another person. He's not going to prop up that person. Let me just say up front, when you get that feeling that something is not really God, don't dismiss it. It really is that discernment that the Spirit of God has given you. There's many times where, where something's just not right, and I know it's not right, and I can't put my finger on it always. But I know it's the Spirit of God giving me discernment. And if I obey it, guess what? I'm going to, I'm going to benefit every time from it. If I, if I dismiss it, uh, oftentimes it leads me in the wrong place. And I, I just face uh, some bad consequences because of it. Listen, there's sometimes that things in the church can even be demonic. Once again, I know that sounds a little extreme, but I want you to understand that's true. And, and it makes sense because look at how Satan is described in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, And we're going to see it as we walk through discernment today. But it says, and no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into what? An angel of light. I mean, he uses deception. He looks appealing. He looks like an angel from God, right? He looks like an angel of light, but he's really Satan. And we need to understand that Satan, he really can't create anything. You understand that, right? I want to give us a perspective because Satan can't like make something out of nothing. All that Satan can do is take and manipulate something that God has already created in this world to now use it as a force of destruction in the lives of people. This is what he does. He's a master manipulator. And so he is, takes deception uh, of God's truths and, you, and perverts them. That's what deception is. It's perversion of God's truths. And so we read this in 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 10. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And we already saw this in Matthew chapter 7. Many of you came and you did all of these miracles. You cast out demons. You did all of these things, and yet you weren't mine. Satan will counterfeit miracles. He will counterfeit healings sometimes. He will counterfeit 
just deceptions, right? He will have lying wonders in front of people so, because he's trying to pull you away from God. But the Holy Spirit is the one that makes us aware when these counterfeits are happening in our midst. And we're able to identify that that's not God. And we're able to call it for what it really is. And so the first area that the gift works in helping us is to keep in check that the gifts are operating in the church the way that God intends them to. And when they're not, when they're based on somebody just propping themselves up and they're just they're counterfeit, or when they're demonic in nature, the church is able to recognize it and not be deceived because of it and to call it for what it was or what it is. The second thing that discernment does is it helps us determine what is false doctrine. In some ways, I think you could see the value of why God would give this church or, or this gift to the early church because, listen, they didn't have the Bible like we have. Remember, it's being written. Paul's writing it. Many of the other authors are writing the New Testament at this time. And so they didn't have all of these written records to go back through and test, okay, does this line up with God's word? And so many of them are hearing it firsthand and there's teachers going around that are false teachers and false prophets that are spreading doctrines that really aren't the truth. And so the Holy Spirit would come in and give this gift to go, wait a minute, that's just not right. And, and he, he would let you supernaturally be able, able to identify things that are just simply not true. In fact, Paul wrote the Galatians and he said this in Galatians 1, 6 through 7, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. And so there are people coming in who are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. I wish I could say that this doesn't happen today, but we know it does. And unfortunately, even though we have access to this great Bible, to the Word of God, guess what? There are plenty of false doctrines out there. And they've crept into the church and they're leading many in the church astray. And it's important that we recognize it and that this gift is in operation because it is the very gift that re will reveal to us when these deceptions are present in our midst. One of the greatest ways we see this playing out in the church today is, is really in a subtle way. It's really that much of the church and the world is using the same words, but they're using different definitions for those words. And so they have different meanings applied to those words. And if you're not careful and if you're not aware of these things, you can easily get sucked into the deception that is around us. Warren Wearsby said this, Satan likes to use the Christian vocabulary, but he doesn't like to use the Christian dictionary. And I think that is such a profound truth that, that we need to be aware of, especially in light of, of really discerning the spirits. For example, Satan often, he doesn't promote strife and war. I mean, every once in a while he does, but most of the time, guess what he does? He promotes peace and unity. Problem is, is he's promoting a different peace and a unity than what God promotes as peace and unity. This is what the coexist movement is all about. Or the interfaith movement, where we get all of these people of faith to stand up and, and actually have a sign of peace and unity when really there's no unity at all within that and there can't ever be. The problem isn't peace and unity, but it's, it's what peace and unity mean. And the Bible has very important definitions of what those things mean. Listen, as a, as a Christian, we are actually commanded, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. I mean, we're told not to yoke ourselves up and to, to be in this life arm in arm with people who are unbelievers. That doesn't mean we don't minister to them. We don't live side by side. We don't serve. It, it just means we don't yoke ourselves to those people. We're actually called to come out from among the world, right? To be holy. You know, that word to be holy actually means that we separate ourselves to Christ. Why? Because all religions are not equal. We can't be holy if we're not separating ourselves to Christ and we're, we're, we're engaging in idolatry by linking arms with all these other religions in the world. You have to understand that. Look what Jesus says. He says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So you see how deception creeps in? 
using terminology that we all like it to hear, and yet it subtly changes its meaning. Listen, Satan twists it so that he, he makes the church look like they're at war with the world, when the reality is the world is at war with the church. Do you understand that? It's not the other way around, but, but he just slips it in there. Everyone else exists together. We coexist, but there's the church off on its own. And, and it looks like the church is at war with the world when the world is at war with the church. Listen, we can continue with how Satan promotes living for the good of others and being kind to all. Good principles, things we're called to do in the Bible. What is promoted, though, is promoted in the world is tolerance is really a form, the form of love. Or the new buzzword for today is equality, right? That's what we're talking about. Right now we see this in, in the Equality Act that's going through the Senate right now. And really, it sounds good, right? The idea that we're all equal and that fairness is, is really important that should take place, and yet it strips the rights of Christians to be treated fairly, to be able to hold on to their firmly held Christian beliefs of what God's Word says is true and what's not and forces us to adhere to a different standard that's in this world. On top of that, let me just say this. Equality is not even a concept, really, we see in the Bible. The only equality we see in the Bible is this, and it's an important equality, but let me point it out to you. It's Galatians 3.38 or 28. It says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile nor slave nor free, nor there is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay? We're all one in our oneness and completeness is in Christ Jesus. And so we're all one in Christ, but even in light of that, what? God says he gives us gifts, right? We're studying that right now. Do all of us have the same gifts? Do all of us have equal gifts? No. We all have a variety of gifts. And we all complement each other, right? Through the gifts. Jesus tells a story of the parable of the talents where he gave each person a certain amount of talents and he says this, each in accordance with their own abilities. Okay, And you can go on and on and on with story after story after story in the Bible and you don't see equality being taught. What God does is he creates us each as unique individuals who find our completeness in God alone. That's what we're taught in Scripture. What Satan wants to do is to strip everyone of their uniqueness until Quite frankly, everyone is miserable. That's what happens when our identity in Christ is stripped. Listen, this is why Paul taught this in Philippians 4, 12 through 13. He says this, I know what it is like to be in need, and I know what it is like to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And look what he says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Christian, listen, don't get caught up in this false doctrines of this world that pervert the scriptures. The secret to your life being fulfilled is not in you being equal to everyone else around you. No. It's sometimes life is going to be difficult. But listen, your strength, your completeness is found in Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Christ is the one that really completes our lives. And so whatever we end up going through in life, as long as we have Christ, that's, that's the point. Paul says, hey, I know. I've been where I've had nothing. But he's complete. He's found the secret. And this is why it's very important because guess what, Christians? So many Christians today are falling into these false doctrines and thinking, well, just equality is going to fix life and make everyone happy. It's not. It actually is a false doctrine that is deceptive and leading us away from Christ, who is the only one that can make us complete. Let me give you one more false doctrine and deception that is creeping into our, our lives today, and it's, it's full-fledged here, and it's that we are falling into the definition of good and evil being changed around us. 
The Bible says a strict warning about this. Look what it says in Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Listen, this is something that is prevalent around us today. We keep calling good evil and evil good. And it's happening almost on a daily basis and it's getting very sickening. And as Christians, we should be like really aware of what's going on. Listen, we fall into it too sometimes. It's crept into the church many times. So we say, oh, well, we just told a little white lie, right? I mean, we try to soften the blow when really it's lies. There's no white lies. It's a lie. Or we don't call abortion murder. We call it a choice. See how we make that shift? Or we ban Christian values and accept every other value that's out there. Listen, I've, I've had conversations with people who are Christians saying, we can't force morality on anybody. And yet they will cheer and adhere to the laws that are forcing and celebrating immorality on everyone. Where did you get that? It's a deception that's crept into the church. The sad truth is, is that many people, even in the church today, tend to live by majority rule standards. If the majority of our culture says something's right, well, it must be right. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. If the Bible says that it's wrong, if the culture says it's right, well, then the Bible needs to adopt it and adjust to it, right? We stand with the culture. There, these are examples of false doctrines that have been slipping into the church so much around us today. And what is worse than just believing wrong is that when the church is deceived about what is actually sin, it ends up actually stripping the power of the gospel from going forth and literally being able to change and transform lives. It actually sets people up to literally send even more people to hell. Listen, get that because this is so important. When the church doesn't declare what is sin, it actually paves the way for more people to go to hell. This is why God doesn't want us to be deceived with false doctrines. And I know that might sound extreme, but let me give you a verse to back this up. What does Romans 6.23 says? Many of you, if you've been in the church, you know this, but you haven't made the connection. It says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here's the problem. The more we strip away anything being sin, the least likely we are making it for people to see that they need a gift of salvation. Do you understand that? If you're not a sinner, then you don't, you're not going to hell. If you're good enough, you're okay in life. And when the church begins minimizing sin and doing away with calling sin, sin, it actually strips away the very thing that is going to drive people to the cross. I mean, this is actually why the church should be talking about sin so much. Because it is because when we get to an understanding where we know and see just how bad it is that we are sinners, and that because we're sinners, we deserve hell, that we wake up and begin to see that when God says, hey, I, have, uh, I sent my son, Jesus, to die on the cross for your sins so that you can be redeemed and bought back and you don't have to die in your sins, that you can be put in a right relationship with God, then we cry out and say, yes, I need a Savior. And we receive the incredible gift of grace that Jesus has for us. If we're not a sinner and we don't, see our sins and how destructive it is in our lives. We will never see our need for a Savior. Here's what Satan is doing throughout the deceptions in our culture and in this world. He's taking a bottle that is labeled poison and he's relabeling it and putting something on there like, oh, peppermint. (laughs) It's not poison, it's just peppermint. So a person who thinks that they're okay and it's just some peppermint is going to put that in their glass and drink it and think they're going to be okay, and they have no idea that what they're doing is going to kill them. That is what relabeling sin is like. Listen, it doesn't change the fact that it's sin because we relabeled it. 
It doesn't get rid of the poison. It doesn't eliminate us from the wages of sin being death because we have just relabeled it. It's the poison that's in our lives and all it does is give us a false sense of security that we're going to be okay until one day we realize we're not okay. You understand that Satan is okay with using the same terminology or the same words but just switching the definition so that he can bring deceptions into us? That is what he does with false doctrines. They're false. They're twists on what God's word really says is true. And they're just twisted in such a way that many people buy into because they're just relabeled. Now, there's one more area I want to focus on today for, for what this gift really exposes us to. It exposes us to false prophets and false teachers. Look what it says in Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. Listen, Jesus warns that there is going to be people who are going to infiltrate the church to deceive people. Like their intention is to bring in deceptions, to take advantage of God's people. They're ravaging wolves, Jesus describes them as. And there are many people in the church who are doing this today. They're wreaking havoc, and they're really just wolves in sheep's clothing. Some of them are using some of the false doctrines we just talked about, like redefining sin. In fact, the sad reality is that if you look at an overview of the church probably over the last 25 years, listen, what you're going to probably see is that there's a, been a great undermining of the faith of the church in, those, in that time frame. And most of it has happened from the inside. In many ways, the most effective enemies of the church are those who claim to be Christians. They often spend their time putting the church down. And what they do is they call people away from Christ and onto things like social issues. And this is really what false prophets and teachers do. They call people away from the message of Christ. That is why a big buzzword, another big buzzword in the church today is something you might hear called the social gospel. But I'm going to say this. Anytime you put something in front of the gospel, you pervert it. I don't care if it's a social gospel, the prosperity gospel. They're not the gospel that's in the Bible. They are false gospels that are not rooted in Scripture. What these false teachings end up doing is moving the focus to something other than God. And they end up twisting the work of God in the process. This is why it's so critical that we begin to recognize it. Listen, the powerful truth of the true gospel of Jesus is that he changes us as individuals. And as he changes us as individuals, it ends up spilling over into our communities, into our families, and into our society. But listen, we'll never change society without Jesus. Jesus is the only answer. The gospel is that, of the good news of Jesus is that Jesus came and died for our sins so that we could be redeemed and brought back to him and put in a re right relationship with him. And that means the answer to every problem society faces is Jesus. But the church is getting away from that today. It's getting away from Jesus as being the answer to focusing on all other kinds of social issues around us. Look what happens when we lose that as our focus. 2 Corinthians 11.3, Paul says this, But I fear that as a serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your minds may be seduced from a complete and pure devotion to Christ. Listen, if what you learn in Scripture or what you learn in the church or by other people and what they're teaching you is not leading you to a greater devotion to Jesus, then it's a false message. It's from a false prophet or a false teacher. And you're receiving a deception. And the Spirit of God will alert you to that and be like, something's just not right in this. Something's just not clicking. Second Peter, he tells us some important warnings about false prophets and teachers and how we can spot them. And so let's walk through this. Second Peter 2, 1 through 3, it says, But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will 
be false teachers among you. Then they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who, brought, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. And many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories and their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. First notice that these false prophets are amongst you. Do you see that? They're among the people. We need to know that because I think sometimes we believe that because we're in church, we're in a safe space. Daniel Defoe, who wrote Robinson Crusoe, said this, wherever God erects a house of prayer, the devil builds a chapel there. And there's a profound truth there. And I, I don't say that because we need to be afraid of anything. I just say that because God tells us, be on alert, be aware that these things are around you so you don't fall into deception. Because there are people that are, are in any church, our church, that are sheep's are, are sheep and wolves clothing, or wolves in sheep's clothing, sorry. <laughs> the second thing is we need to be aware of is that they will secretively in- introduce destructive heresy. Uh, they don't, most of the time, come out with destructive heresies that are boldly proclaimed in front of everyone. They're just little pieces here and there that kind of slip in secretively to get people off of what is really important. It's not out in the open, at least at first. It's always done behind closed doors. That's the way deceptions work. And so it's very important that we have our ears open and we're aware of these false heresies and why we correct them the moment we hear them. The third thing is that they end up denying the Lord who bought them. Listen, this always takes place. Eventually it's going to come out that the focus is not on God. The focus is not on Jesus. It's on something else or somebody else and it's not on. They end up putting people over God. And that's what we talked about many months ago where easily we put the second commandment in front of the first commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. And I said this, Many times we elevate that second commandment of the first. And if you do the first commandment right, guess what? You're going to be loving your neighbor as yourself. But if you put the second commandment above the first, you don't end up loving God more. You end up loving him less. And this is what so many people have done with false teachings. They've elevated people and things over God and they end up loving God less and leaving him in the dirt. He's not Lord. Let's look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty. It says this, in fact, you put up with, uh, with it if someone enslaves you, if someone devours you, if someone captures you, if someone dominates you, if someone hits you in the face. Listen, there's so many people in the church today, and I'm not saying our church, I'm saying the church as a whole, who when, when they're being deceived about their faith, because they're listening literally to all kinds of false truths that are out there, all kinds of theories that take them away from God. And it ends up never improving on the gospel truth that they believed in the beginning. And the re- end result is it leads you right back into slavery, right back into somebody else dominating your life. And it's almost like you sit there and you let someone punch you in the face and you just let them, let them do it and, you're th- and you thank them for it. That's what deceived people do. Thank you for oppressing me again. But Peter says this that is sobering. He says many will follow their depraved conduct. It's not just a few that will go this way. Many will follow these false teachers in their depraved conduct. It's really disheartening. And let me just say, it should be a wake-up call. This This is really what's happening to so many people in the church today. I mean, think about how many people are leaving the church and leaving God. And, and the reason is, the reason they're not following God, the reason why they're leaving, is they, they've fallen into deception. They haven't really seen the truth. Finally, Peter points out that what these false teachers do is, is they're exploiting people because they make up stories. They're really good storytellers. I'm going to tell you that's one of the things. These, these 
false teachers, these false prophets, they're really good at telling a good story, keeping your attention and, and making you just like them. They're likable people. The problem is, is they're exploiting you and they've just made up stories to tell. It'd be easy to us to get upset about these false teachers, but listen, John says this. He places the responsibility on us not to be deceived. Look what he says in 1 John 4, 1 through 3. He says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, and this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that has, acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. And so what John says is it's yours and my responsibility to test the Spirit to see if they're from God or not, or to see if they're false prophets. He's going to let us be able to see it, but many of us aren't even taking that first step. We just buy hook, line, and sinker. We turn to this channel and say, okay, well, there's a preacher. Well, at least he has reverend in front of his name, so whatever he says, I'm just going to believe, Right? Or we turn to this channel and, and we hear this ministry and, and, and so we don't scrutinize the word. We're not like the Bereans who are looking to see if what is being taught is true and scrutinizing over every word. You should be doing that here. Scrutinizing every sermon and every word that is said, is this really God or is it not? Or is there something false in this? Because that is the job of every one of us as believers. Listen, do you remember the parable Jesus told of the wheat and tares? In the parable, wherever God sowed good seed, guess what was happening? Satan was sowing weeds right next to it. He went behind and he sowed weeds. Wherever God is doing good, Satan is going to be there trying to sow weeds in our midst. And we need to be aware of that. And this is why this gift is so important in the church. It's people who recognize and see the deceptions around us. They see the false teachers. They see the false prophets. They understand when a gift is not really God. It's not really from God. So as we close today, I want you to think about this. I hope you see the importance and how vital this gift is to be in, in our midst. But I hope you understand that only great things of value get counterfeited. Do you understand that? I mean, listen, if, if you did this, you didn't go to jail for it, but nobody really is out there counterfeiting monopoly money, right? There are many people who have tried to counterfeit real money and gone to jail because of it. Why? Because you only counterfeit what is a value. And that's what Satan is doing. He's taking what is of the real value and he's trying to counterfeit it so that he can use it for his destructive purposes. And the Spirit of God gives us the ability to spot these deceptions, to discern these spirits in our midst. I've used this illustration many times, but I think it's important to repeat here when federal agents are looking for counterfeit money, they train their agents not by looking at all the counterfeits that are out there in the world. They, they train their agents by looking at the real thing and they study and, and are able to know the ins and outs of what makes a real bill a real bill. They know what a real $20 bill looks like. And because they have learned and know everything about a, a real bill, they're able to, count, to spot a counterfeit whenever it shows up. They have trained eyes to just, they see when something's not genuine. The same is true with us. When we spend time in God's word, in the truth, immersing ourselves in the truth, we are so grounded in that truth that when a deception comes our way, we spot it immediately. Jesus said this in John 8, 31 through 32. He says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Listen, when we hold on to God's truth, when we hold on to it, when we study it, when we're firmly holding on to Jesus' teaching, that's where the real freedom comes. That's where we're really able to walk in the freedom that God has for us. And we will meet, need that more than ever as, as the end times approach. Listen, one of my most important prayers that I've been praying for at least a year now it's for God to give me the spirit of discernment, to open my eyes 
to any deceptions around me so that I would not be deceived. And really, I've been praying this way because, because I read Matthew 24, 24. And it just opened my eyes to the fact that pride comes before a fall, right? And I need to be humble in this. Look what Matthew 24, 24 says. For false prophets and false messiahs will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive who? If possible, the elect. If possible, those that are closest to Christ. That's sobering, isn't it? If we're going to get through this life without being deceived, then we're going to need this gift operating in our lives. We're going to need to be so close to God and His truth and His Spirit revealing to us the deceptions around us. And it's humbling because, like I said in the beginning, one of the greatest dangers about being deceived is that you just don't know you're deceived. If you did, you wouldn't be deceived. So that person who is deceived has no idea that they're walking in deception. I don't say this to leave us in fear. I say this because I want us to point us back to Jesus. Is your devotion Jesus? Because when it comes down to it, we're saved because of him and what he has done for us. Not on anything else. Our hope is in nothing else but Jesus and what he's done for us. That he is now our Lord. And at the end of the day, it really comes down to the lordship of Jesus in our lives. Listen, deceptions, they're always pulling us away from Jesus. They really are. When Jesus says, hey, you did all of these things in my name, but I never knew you. It's because, really, you were focused on the healings, on the miracles, on casting out demons. You're just using Jesus to do those things. And it wasn't about Jesus. Deceptions come in so subtly in our lives and take the focus away from Jesus. And this gift is so needed because at the end of the day, what matters is that our eyes are on Jesus. I know I've said this over and over in this series, but that's because it's so true. It's not about the gifts. These gifts are given to us so that we might know Jesus more and more in our lives. And so we need this gift operating in the church and in our personal lives in a great way so that we keep Jesus the main thing always. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that's found in it. And I pray, God, that we would draw close to you in your heart. God, move through your power and your spirit to teach us what is true and what is false, God. Open our eyes to when the gifts even are not being used in a way to honor you around us. God, open our eyes to false doctrines that are in our midst and are all, all around our culture and our society and even sometimes has creeped, crept into the church. And help us to see what is true, God. Open our eyes to false teachers, God, false prophets who would come in our midst and, and literally try to take up positions to mislead people into things that are not true, God. And Lord, we just pray that at the end of the day, Lord, we would just know you more and more. Jesus, thank you for the privilege, the honor to know you as Lord and Savior, God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you're here today and you're watching and Jesus isn't your Lord, he isn't your Savior, at least yet. Today is a day of salvation, the Bible says. Hey, today's the opportunity for you to wake up and, and maybe in the past you've been deceived and you didn't know you were deceived, but all of a sudden today, God has removed that veil and you see the truth that Jesus is the one you need in your life to be your Lord and Savior. If that's you today, could you pray with me? Could I lead you in a prayer? Be my honor and privilege just to lead you in a prayer of salvation where you're where you're at today. Let's just pray together. Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. God, th this world can't redefine sin and take it away. It just can't. Today, you've opened my eyes to that. And because I see that I am a sinner, I see that I also need a Savior. And I thank you that you died on the cross for my sins so that I could be made right with you, Jesus. I receive this gift of salvation today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, from this day forward, I want to live 
my life in such a way that brings you honor and glory all the days that I have left to live. Thank you for this incredible gift, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that, would you let us know? Our, our website's listed here at the bottom, and we'd love to connect with you to give you the next steps to following Jesus uh, and even give you a Bible if you don't have one. P- so please reach out to us, send us an email, let us know. Also, if you have any prayer needs, let us know as well. But we're going to go to Lord and worship. And listen, we're going to worship and we're going to have communion together and we're going to worship some more. So if you don't have communion ready, will you just grab that? And I'll be back in a few moments after worship is done and lead us in a closing prayer. But let's just worship and have communion together. may be darkest but your light is greater you light our way God you light our way when evil is rising you're rising higher with power to say with power to say oh you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end your word never fails you keep hope alive because you are alive jesus you are alive sing that chorus again you keep hope alive you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end your word never fails you keep hope alive because you are alive jesus you are alive death had a stronghold but your life was strong gold rose from the grave rose up from the grave when evil is rising you're rising higher with power to save with power to save you keep oh you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end your word never fails you keep hope alive because you are alive jesus you are alive there's hope oh there's hope in the morning hope in the evening there's hope because you're living hope because you're breathing there is hope in the breaking hope in the sorrow hope for this moment my hope for tomorrow there's hope in the morning hope in the evening there's hope because you're living hope because you're breathing there is hope in the breaking hope in the sorrow there's hope for this moment my hope for tomorrow you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end your word never fails you keep hope alive because you are alive jesus you are alive there's hope hallelujah oh there is hope in the morning hope in the evening hope because you're living hope because you're breathing there's hope in the breaking hope in the sorrow there's hope for this moment my hope for tomorrow there's hope in the morning hope in the evening there's hope because you're living hope because you're breathing lord there's hope in the breaking hope in the sorrow hope for this moment my hope for tomorrow you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end your word never fails you keep hope alive because you are alive you are alive you keep hope you keep hope alive you keep hope alive from the beginning to end your word never fails you keep hope alive because you 
are alive. Jesus, you are alive. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Believe that this morning. Praise your name, Jesus. We're going to take time just to think about the Lord and hit the table before us, the communion. If you have your elements, I hope you do. I was saying in the first service, I just finished reading the book of Leviticus and I'm into numbers now. And it was just amazing to see all that those millions of people had to do to maintain their worship with God. All the sacrifices, all the offerings that they had to bring before him, and they could not be blemished. They had to be perfect sacrifices. And I'm thinking ahead then how Jesus became our one and only perfect sacrifice as he went to that cross for us and how he was crucified for us and how his body was broken, really broken. It says in Isaiah 53 that they couldn't even recognize him. He was so broken and brutalized for you, and for me. And so this day, as we think about his body broken, we take this wafer in our hands. And Lord, we just thank you for coming to this earth, Jesus, and dying for us. Thank you for your broken body on that cross, Lord, that gives us healing, that gives us peace today. You reconciled us, Lord, through your broken body, and we just give you thanks, God. Let's partake this morning. In like manner, let's take this cup together. As he took that night with the disciples, that the bread and broke it, so he took the cup later on in that evening. And he said, this is my body, which is poured out for you, my blood that brings you close to me. And we won't share it again together until that time in heaven. And so we're looking forward to that when we get to partake of this, this communion with the Lord in heaven. Let's partake today. Thank you, Lord, for your shed blood this morning. For the forgiveness of our sins, Lord. You don't look at our past anymore, Lord. You say it's covered. You covered, Lord. You removed our sins, Lord. As far as the east is from the west, you have removed our transgressions, Lord Jesus. We give you praise, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank us, thank you, Lord, that you never gave up on us. You always follow us, Lord. You always carry us. Standing on this mountain top, looking just how far we've come, knowing that for every step you were with us. Kneeling on this battleground, seeing just how much you've done, knowing. Every victory is your power in us. Scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say. faithful Lord. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. Never once did we ever walk alone. Never once did you leave us on our own. You are faithful, Lord. You are on this mountaintop standing on this mountaintop looking just how far we've gone going just for every step you've been with and kneeling on this battleground seeing just how much you've done knowing every victory is your power is for scars and struggles on the way, but with joy our hearts can say, yes, our hearts can say, lift your voice, church, never once, never once did we ever walk alone, yeah, yeah, never once did you leave us on our own, you've been faithful, God, you are Thank you, 
Lord Never once did you leave us on our own You are faithful, God You are faithful, God You are faithful You are faithful, God You are faithful Scars and struggles, scars and struggles on the way But with joy our hearts can say Yes, our hearts can say Never once did we ever walk alone Believe it, church Never once did you leave us on our own You are faithful, God You are faithful, God You are faithful Every step Every step we are breathing in your grace. Evermore we are breathing out your praise. You are faithful, God. Let's sing that again. Every step, Lord. Every step we are breathing in your grace. Every more we'll be breathing your praise. He is faithful. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful, Lord. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. You are faithful, God. You are faithful. Thank you, Lord. That's our testimony, God. You are faithful. You never leave us alone. You never let us on our own, Lord. Well, it's so great to be with you today. I hope that God has just blessed you for spending time with us in our service. And I'm just praying that God moves in our midst and, and makes us discerning people that gives us this gift of discernment all around us uh, so that we're able to know what is true and what is false. And it's such a wonderful gift. I pray that God uses you this week to be able to see those things and that you respond when the Spirit just makes you uncomfortable. Let me just close in a, a blessing. And next week we're going to be back. We're going to be wrapping up this uh, gift list here. We're going to be looking at tongues and interpretation of tongues. And so we invite you to be back with us as we go through uh, those two gifts that are complementary to each other. But let me pray a blessing and we'll... Hopefully see you next week, but may the Lord bless you. May God keep you. May God make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God grant you his peace. Amen. God bless. Have a wonderful day.